Okay, our task today is rhythm section, right? And yes. Yeah. Exactly. What did you do with your homework? <laughs> Good. Yeah, I was able to. Uh, I I watched all of the videos um, on your on your channel for that section. Uh, I haven't finished the like the rhythm with the masters, the last one, the, the two hour long clinic. That, that's long, yeah. And, it, I, and it's not all of that's super valuable, but. I went, I went. I went through. Uh, I uh, maybe the first forty-five minutes or so. I've, I've I've listened to, and I I plan on listening to the rest of it when I have the time. But yeah, it's good stuff. And then I I I read all the chapters on the rhythm section as well. Yeah, great. All right. So, are there? Has that brought up any questions? Or, or I usually deal with this problem. I don't see it listed here. Or. Uh, I've tried to deal with this problem the way you're talking about it, but it hasn't worked. Are there, are there any kinds of things like that? Yeah, well, so my, my biggest problem is getting a bass player. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you have any suggestions on how to recruit a good bass player or how to uh, help somebody learn to play bass if they're not a bass player. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> is there an orchestra at your school? There is, Yes. There must be some bass players in the orchestra. You know? They are, and every every single time I've talked to them, they've just been kind of like, eh, no, I'm not into jazz. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I just approached it wrong or <laughs> or something, but so that's that's probably where I need to, to <clears throat> put a better effort next year. But usually, it's harder to find out who the guitar player is because he's not in your program at all. But the bass players should be in your program. Yeah, well, I, I haven't had a guitar player either, but right. I feel like. I feel like I got to find a bass player before I yes <laughs> before I worry about finding a guitar player. So, and the guitar players are sitting home working on their ears and their improv and everything. <laughs> yes. yep. They end up being some of your better soloists usually, but yeah, it's hard to find out who they are because they're not identified in your program in any other way. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you know, you start asking around uh, some of the kids. Hey, do you know anybody that plays the guitar? You know, and of course they're not going to play jazz guitar. <laughs> right yeah probably none of them are doing that so it, it may not be the right approach to say hey come and play some jazz guitar it might be uh hey do you do you have some guys that are really good rock players or you know uh, and then you can say hey uh it would be great for you to learn another style and then you make yourself really marketable <laughs> you can right. actually play some gigs you could actually earn your way through college playing some jobs you know if you actually have the jazz style and the rock style now you're really marketable <laughs> right. yeah, that's a good that's good. and I, I don't know i i would probably uh look for some way to allure them to something that means something to them <laughs> right <laughs> And the jazz isn't going to mean anything to them, anything to them yet. We're hoping, right. of course, we're hoping, of course, that it will. But yeah, it's... I think most students once once they get into it, realize, enjoy it, and love it. It's but sometimes it's. Yeah. Yeah, uh, your bass players. I mean, how many orchestral gigs are there really? You know, I I mean. Mm -hmm. This is not a current thing. I don't know. This is a few years back. I don't know any current statistics, but it was not too long ago that I heard about a tuba job that was advertised in a symphony. They had over 150 applicants for one tuba chair. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if that tuba player can't do anything else, he's probably going to starve. <laughs> you know, there's got to be some other possibilities there because... Only so many bass players in an orchestra, but man, it's interesting that on the on the professional scene, even here in Utah, bass players are at a commodity. I mean, they, yeah, that if you play bass, you know, you're going to keep pretty busy. It seems like if you're a good player, especially, you know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah that makes sense. it seems like there's often not enough bass players to go around for whatever reason. But then think about it: every single group, rock group country group jazz group whatever needs bass yeah they all need it yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> i don't know if you can kind of get the ears of and, and maybe the support of the orchestra teacher i don't know who your orchestra teacher is but uh, john finley john finley yeah he's, he's been involved at the umea level uh, with the orchestra for quite yeah. a number of years taught a box seller for quite a while but he's been at Ridgeline here in the last I don't know if you could get him on your side to say, hey, 
it's wonderful to work in your classical bass, and sometimes you get a chance to play in an orchestra, but there is a whole lot more work out there for a bass player. If you learn the jazz style, you and if you learn the jazz style, that's an open door to learn rock and funk and a lot of you know. And I, you could even play some recordings of some really cool sounding bass stuff, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know. You do have to somehow light a fire under them, but. Uh, at least you kind of know who they are. You can kind of go after them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good. I think I think looking looking back, the my effort has been kind of you approach them once and be like, hey, we're start, we're doing jazz band. You want to want to come try it? And then they're going to be like, eh. it's like I need to take a little bit more systematic, um, yeah. thoughtful approach. I think. Well, that's how it is at BYU to an extent too. You know, you we have all these bass players in the orchestra, and then very few of them audition for the jazz stuff. And you say, "Hey, you ought to come and play some jazz." Oh, I don't do jazz, you know. But it's like, you know, this is your opportunity to learn. Right. Now, once you're out of school, it's too late. You know. I mean, well, maybe not really, but it's a lot harder though. Yeah. Makes it pretty tough to be able to get the experience you need to get any kind of professional work. And mm -hmm. frankly, there is a lot of work for somebody that's versatile as a bass player. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some of you want to go to college. Maybe you want to go to college in some other area, but this could pay your way through college. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This, this could help you because good bass players can get scholarship help in most cases, but they also can work enough to pay a lot of bills. I mean... Kids don't think about this very much, but they don't have any earning power, you know, as kids. And it's like, uh, okay, you go down to Wendy's and you get a gig working at Wendy's, and what do you make per hour, you know, about mm -hmm. maybe nine bucks if you're lucky. Right. And they work you late, and it's, it's they're not very flexible when you need to get off to play a concert or you need to get off to do something else, you know. Right. And, uh, and think about it, if if you play a job, you could go out and do one night on a Friday night and make more money than you, quite a bit more money than you would work working at Wendy's the whole week. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> and sometimes uh, just some, some of that, I don't know, some reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think most, I mean, most students, myself included, aren't very connected or aware of that type of, those type of opportunities. Yeah. The live performing musicians is right. Is, is not a scene I've, I've, I've been involved with. And so, but I love the idea of teaching my students the skills so that they could do that. Yeah. Well, here I was a lowly starving doctoral student and I was doing recording sessions and going out and playing gigs besides teaching private lessons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was making a lot more than if I'd have been a clerk at the circle K or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah, spending absolutely. a lot less time to make that money, plus where I had more time to study. But also, every time I'm working, I'm working in my area. Mm -hmm. I'm getting better at music because every time I'm working, I'm working in music. I'm right. not flipping hamburgers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I have, cool. a student, I have a student you could use as an example, Monique. Um, she just graduated last Tuesday from Orem High School. She's been the lead alto this last year in Caleb's uh, sound house, you know, the Crescent mm -hmm. Band. But yeah. she also played Barry in the All-State Band as a junior, and then she played alto in the All-State Band, jazz band as a senior. As a junior, she played first alto in the All-State Concert Band. <laughs> uh, and she's pretty strong at flute and clarinet. And she got, a, she got good ratings on all three instruments at the State Solo Ensemble. <laughs> Uh, and somehow she she got the idea she wanted to audition at several schools. I was expecting, you know, I've been nurturing her for two, a couple of three years here, about three years, and I figured that I would get her at BYU, which most of the time that, that works out that way. But she auditioned at Berkeley, and they gave her un, unheard of a full ride four year scholarship, wow. which is which she's decided she's going to take him up on it. And it's like, yeah, darn it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, but this is what you could use with the kids. Here she is, a senior in high school, no earning power, maybe nine bucks an hour. And because she worked hard on her instrument, that's about 45000 per semester. Yeah. 
And if you figure that only at eight semesters, what's that, 360000 or something like that? I mean, she just made $360,000. Yeah. I mean, what other high school student can do that doing anything else? You know? Right. Yeah, I think it's a good point. It's like uh, sports and music are the only places that really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. So I don't know whether that's the right approach, but I think it uh, it's an approach that, I mean, with my private students, I frequently try to help them realize, hey, every time you practice, you're putting money in the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is this is a way to pay your way through college. Yeah, yeah, that makes. But if sense. you don't end up going into music, you can still pay your way through college. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I have that thought. You know, I need, I need to help my students see that a little bit more. That's not something I've brought yeah. up. And I tell my kids, say you should be teaching privately. This is my better high school students, of course, but, but I'll, I'll tell you know when I was in the ninth grade, I had ten clarinet students. You did? Yeah, I've been, I was taught privately, uh, and small group lessons from the ninth grade on took a couple of years off from my mission of course and uh, but i've been teaching privately ever since i was in the ninth grade <laughs> wow. Very cool. and there's no reason that you, you may say well i'm not that good enough yet you know what you're you're plenty good to offer a lot to some of those kids in the elementary school those beginner students that are not getting any help you're plenty good enough to do that you know right and you learn so much by yeah. doing exactly Exactly. And and how how much money can you make doing that? Well, a lot more than you can doing anything else in your life at this point. <laughs> you know, probably two or three times as much at least. Mm -hmm. Plus you're your own boss. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. You need a little flexibility, you can take it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And that's and, it's, and that's, that teaches that teaches so many skills. Yeah. Cool. I I think that's good. And then you I like what you said also about just kind of lighting the fire under them to, to get them going. They, you got to find what's, um, help them see what's possible. Yeah. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was sitting in a clarinet lesson with Steve Allen. And one day he said, you know, you're really coming, becoming quite a musician. If you were to work really hard the next two years, when you're a senior, they will literally pay you to come to college. Really? I never thought of that kind of thing before, you know? yeah. but it was like, wow. I mean, I, I grew up on the, on the poor side of the tracks in Salt Lake, you know, over on the West side. I mean, we didn't have money. I right. didn't know any way that my parents were going to pay for college and stuff. And, yeah. and frankly, that wasn't a lot of in, indoctrination in our family. I mean, I'm the first bachelor's degree ever in my whole family. I'm either yeah. my mom's or my dad's side, <laughs> let alone doctorate, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And so I really was never planning on a master's or a doctorate, but I, one day in a clarinet lesson with David Randall at BYU, he said, you know, I don't tell everybody this, but he said, you should go to graduate school. <laughs> I said, really? What's that? He says, you know, like when you get a master's degree? Oh, I'd heard of that. <laughs> I didn't know what yeah. graduate school was. <laughs> it, it just gradually, you know, fell into place, but I, I didn't. Anyway, it was in that clarinet lesson. I became very inspired, you know, when he said, <clears throat> and this is, I'm a 10th grader. He yeah. said, if you work really hard the next two years, every college in the state will pay you to come to school. You can just choose where you want to go to school and they'll pay you to come there. It's like, wow. So I did. I worked really hard the next two years. <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, I won the state Sterling Scholar in music and every school in the state offered me a full ride scholarship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> literally came to pass but uh yeah. anyway uh I, I think that the that it, it helps to inspire and then i went to summer jazz camps and they'd say hey if you're a doubler you make a lot of extra money you know if you're like if you're if you're hired on saxophone and then you also play the clarinet that's 25 percent extra but if you also play the flute that's another 10 percent extra and if you played anything else like alto flute or bass clarinet or or even like oboe or bassoon, you're you're gonna be able to make a lot more money, you know. So like if you're if let's say you're playing the third book on West Side Story, it's it's uh, flute, piccolo, oboe, English horn, clarinet, bass clarinet, and tenor and baritone saxophones. You've got eight instruments, you know. Mm -hmm. So 
So I'm making 185% of the base pay while the French horn player sitting next to me is making the base pay. <laughs> yeah. But then that's only right because I had to play all those instruments. I got to buy all those instruments. I got to have all those instruments. Yeah, yeah, you have to be ready with all of them and have all that equipment. Yeah. But they talked about guys doubling and, and the work that they did in, in the recording studio and stuff. And I it kind of got working in my blood. I thought that's... And I, I really got really serious about being a really good flute and really good clarinet player. And it's where my doubling really got its impetus, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... I mean, it happened to me that way. It seems to me that it can happen that way. And, you know, I wasn't even mercenary. Pretty much everybody today is pretty mercenary. You know, the parents are indoctrinating them that, hey, you can't make a living in music. You know, you got to do something that makes a lot of money and stuff. You know, right. <laughs> yeah. and it wasn't that way when I was growing up. You know, I, I didn't even think of going to school that way. I thought of it as what are my talents and what should I do to develop my talents and and what's the best way I can serve in society and and, and in the kingdom and so on and it never occurred to me whether i'd make enough money or not that was not the issue <laughs> that's i think that's so great i think that's so great yeah. and it's just not that way with kids now I mean, it's like this kid a few years ago fall semester calls ron bruff uh, and starts talking about drum stuff you know and, and ron says well you're not a percussion major and he says <laughs> you kidding my dad think i was on welfare <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of indoctrination that's out there, you know? Yeah, it is. And so if you can kind of appeal to those kids in terms of, hey, this is really great for your future, <laughs> and you can make a lot more money doing this than you can something else. And even think about Monique. She got $45,000 a semester for eight semesters. I mean, holy cow. Yeah. What else did you do? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's incredible. So I, I know we're going a little off from the, the, the yeah. rhythm section, but I... Yeah question along these lines um that's something i've kind of been with, wrestling with i mean the the music industry you know in our country is huge um, yeah. obviously uh, most most of the music that's represented in, in the music industry from my perspective is not the kind of music most students are learning or making in school true true um, and so anyway that's that's something i've been reading a lot into and wondering about so as, as someone who's been heavily involved in, in music education your whole career, but also heavily involved in recording and, you know, the professional music side, yeah. um, do you see that as, as a problem? Do you see it as something that needs to be resolved or do you think it, see it as just a reality of, of musical culture? I think it is unfortunately a bit of a reality, but I think it really does need to be resolved because, well, I'll do this quickly. I don't want to take a little time out of this, but yeah. 1992, I sat in the conference room up on the fifth floor there around that big table. Mm -hmm. And it was the 1992 curriculum committee. Okay. And I had in front of me an agenda form. And at the top, it said 1990, 1992 curriculum committee agenda. And then it went down, you know. And at a certain point, Ron Simpson said, do you, did you ever know Ron Simpson? I don't yeah. think so. He retired before you got there. But uh, do you know who Ron Saltmarsh is? Yes, yes. He basically took Ron Simpson's place. Okay, yeah. But uh, Ron, Ron said, I think we need to be teaching modern chord nomenclature in our theory classes. Mm -hmm. I'm going, yeah, that's a good idea. And the, it just went, Phew. And so in a minute, I brought it back, and I said, wait a minute, folks. Ron made a comment here a minute ago about teaching modern chord nomenclature. I said, I think we need to consider what we're doing with our classes. Yeah. I mean, the value of learning figured bass ver versus the value of learning modern nomenclature is is not even, there's no comparison. Right, right. <laughs> and, okay, good. I'm glad to have that. But I think we need to expand. The, I could tell I was talking to deaf ears, and for some reason I got on my soapbox. I, I, I got really emboldened <laughs> somehow, and I said, yeah. I'm looking at a piece of paper here that says 1992 committee, a, a curriculum committee. I said, I want to pose a question to this committee. Are we going to ever face the fact that we are in the 20th century? Before it's over, we've got eight more years. <laughs> and then I went right around the right around the room. Gordon Jessup was sitting there first, and he at the time he was over the music ed stuff. And I said, Gordon, what are we going to do in the music ed area about this? 
Dave Sargent, what are we going to do in the composition theory area about this? And I went right around the table and I put yeah. everybody on the spot. I mean, I was really <laughs> not like me to do that very much. But <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so Dave Sargent jumps up. Did you ever know Dave Sargent? No. Yeah, he retired before you too, but he was a co composition theory and uh, yeah. great, great composer, but great teacher too, great guy. But he he stood up and passed out some papers and he said oh we've been thinking about that and he passed out these papers and it was just more serialism and crap you know i was like dave this is not the point this was no how do you how do you deal with this you know but on the other hand i was joel leach was a guy who was president of the jazz society the whole jazz network thing mm -hmm. and he teaches at cal state northridge and one day at a at a kind of at a conference we ended up in the bathroom at the same time taking a leak next to each other <laughs> and he said hey i gotta tell you man we got the whole faculty on our side and we completely restructured the curriculum so that it makes sense in modern in modern times and i said my gosh how did you do that <laughs> it is being done in certain places yeah yeah it is. yeah I think Berkeley, I mean, Berkeley is an example of, of, a, of a school that's very much in that way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, I don't know. We've, we've tried to make inroads on that. And actually, we've made some inroads, but it's slow, you know. It's like we're, mm -hmm. we're, not, uh, we're not conquering the beast. But I, and I'll right. tell you one more quick thing. I played on Dave Dirge's recital at uh, Indiana University. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I played on Steve Lenneman's recital at Indiana University, too. <laughs> Surprised he showed up at BYU years later, but, <laughs> but uh, I played on Dave Dirge's recital, and it was a it was a recital that was nominated to receive what they call a performer certificate. This was a very coveted award, and it came if the pre-recital jury elected you to uh, by a certain vote, then mm -hmm. there would be more faculty than usual at your recital. And if they still elected you by a certain margin, then you played it a third time for the ju for just the dean of the school and the chairs of each of the departments there's like only nine people in the final hearing you know and then uh, yeah. past that then you get this pc so it's very coveted you know it really yeah. meant to get it and uh, and dave i played on dave's recital but i didn't even play on the jazz part of it i played on the classical part of it he had some classical and jazz part of it anyway i'm putting my saxophone away we're done i'm coming back and here comes pete eagle he's the harp teacher yeah and, and what came out of his mouth, I did not expect, did not anticipate. But he said, well, he got it. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. He said, yeah, first jazz major to ever receive a PC. I said, wow, that is so great. And he says, yeah, I told the dean that this place is nothing but a museum. All we do is study music that's two and 300 years old. <laughs> that was part of his rationale that helped yeah. him to tip that over, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. So there are a lot of people thinking this way, but there's a lot of people that aren't either that are really dyed in the wool and the old regime, you know. So it's really yeah. hard. Yeah, and it's oh, it's so fascinating, and and I, I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of music in in jazz, you know, in jazz and what we teach in jazz that that helps uh, connect that in a in a way that uh, that doesn't really work as well in the concert band area, you know, in what I'm teaching. But that's, I mean, that's some of the big questions I've been asking myself recently is, you know, how, how, how can I change what I do, what their high school experience to yeah. The, yeah. on that road instead of um, yeah. disconnect them from it. And you're right, the jazz band prepares them a lot more for the stuff we're talking about than the concert band does. They need that experience. They should have the concert band experience. They should have the orchestral experience, you know, absolutely. And they should have all the classical study. I, I'm the first one to say you need to have that classical study. But on the other hand, uh, what are all those kids in that concert band going to do? They're not all going to go into music by a long way, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I have held out the contention that it's very much worthwhile because it enriches that person's life for the rest of their life. Plus, they become audience. And what do we do if we don't have audience? You know? Right, yeah. Those yeah. are the people that are going to keep coming back as audience, and we need to train audience, you know. So, I mean, it's not all bad to feel like you're developing audience. Right, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> keep the arts going. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, a lot of, I mean, what's that? kid playing the euphonium gonna do you know it's like 
<laughs> right. Yeah. I didn't really. <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't think that's necessarily a a, a, a deal breaking kind of question. I mean, he's mm -hmm. learning music, he's learning appreciation of the arts, he's enriching his life with mm -hmm. the experiences that he's having. Plus, he'll become an audience, and I I think that there's a there's a value to that. So right. I don't think we can look at every one of our students as a potential professional musician. Right. But, but I think a lot of them will be. I mean, you got to treat them that way in your jazz band because they won't all become that, but some of them will. Mm -hmm. yeah. and you want to make sure that those who who will or could have that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and the ones that you inspire to work hard are the ones that are going to be the most likely to have that opportunity. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, I don't know. We got off on a tangent yeah. because we're talking about how to recruit bass players, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but maybe there's something to that, you know. Yeah, I, and, found, I found your thoughts valuable. So thank you. And you know, uh, there's some amazing bass players. If you if you were to find something by Christian McBride or Brian Bromberg or somebody like that on the acoustic bass, that's like where they're doing a solo thing, and it's just like you go, "Wow, that is so cool," you know. And then you can find easily some electric bass, like Victor Wooten on electric bass, or Steve Bailey, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Miller, some some of these guys, that, and they, you get them playing on the electric bass solo, you know, and you, so they can just really hear the bass, and they're doing all this cool stuff, you go. Wow, I didn't know you could do that on the bass. Right. Yeah, you could do this. Really, man, I'd love to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. And maybe maybe you need to have a little meeting after school one day. You gotta be in gotta get the orchestra director to help you, I guess, probably, but maybe have a, a short meeting after school one day for bass players. <laughs> yeah. And just and, Maybe you've got some recordings ready to play and some things ready to say and say, man, I'd, I'd love to see a few of you try to fit into this. Is anybody inspired to, I mean, we know you you're not, you don't do this, but that's why you're in school is to learn how to do this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you already know your way around the instrument. So you're half, you're, I mean, you're halfway there. <laughs> right. Your classical work is one of the best things that could ever happen to you. Now let's show you what else you could add to it, you know, that could really make you marketable. 